Good morning, brothers and sisters. How's everybody feeling this morning? Good? The sun is shining. It's a good day, right? Amen. I'm happy to see so many people in the house of God this morning. If you have your Bible, would you open them up to the Gospel of Matthew? We're going to uh, continue in our verse-by-verse -verse study of Matthew's Gospel. And we have hit a milestone again in our verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Matthew's Gospel. We have completed another chapter. We've finished Matthew chapter 24. So as is our practice and our custom here, before we move on to Matthew chapter 25, what we're going to do is Selah. We're going to stop. We're going to pause. We're going to reflect on what we have discovered, on all that God has taught us and revealed to us just through our study of Matthew chapter 24. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to warn you ahead of time that I will be speaking rather fast as we go through and we are reminded of the truths that uh, we learned and that we discovered through these verses in this chapter. Um, but I just want to put your mind at ease. Uh, even though I will be going fast, I've prepared my sermon nerve notes for you so uh, after the service you'll be able to grab those on your way out so that you can have a reference but I want you to be reminded of these things I want you to take note of these things but uh, also just be be um, be a little relaxed even though I'm going to be going rather fast okay so before we even get into that I'd like to just read Matthew chapter 24 I was reminded this week in my own personal study of of how the early church would just come together and just read the scriptures aloud and how powerful it was that the Spirit would just take His Word and it would bring conviction to people just from a simple reading of the public reading of the Scriptures. So we're going to have like a little mini version of that right now as you sit and you follow along as I read and listen to the Word of God as it goes forth. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you that not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and will hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because of lawlessness will be increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation which has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, look, there, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. 
For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, and so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance, so if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. Now, learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of the day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one will be left. Therefore... Be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave? whom his master puts in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, My master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour when he does not know, and will cut him to pieces, and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Would you pray with me one more time, brothers and sisters? Father, oh Lord, you are so good. You are so worthy of praise. Lord, we are convinced that you are worthy of more than we could muster up. God, you are altogether glorious. There is none like you, none with whom we can compare you. For you alone are God. You have no rivals. You have no equal. You are worthy to be worshipped. You are worthy of your creation bowing and singing your praise. And for that reason we have gathered in this place that you might receive all honor and glory and praise. And we as your creatures are desperately in need of you and we ask during this time that you would remind us of the truth that we confess. That you would bring to our remembrance those things which your spirit has convinced us of. And would you give us the grace and the strength and the power and the help that we need, Lord, to continue to endure, to persevere until the end. To be alert, to be vigilant, to heed your truth 
and to live lives that are not wasted, but lives that honor you? And would it start with hearts right now that are ready to hear and to receive what it is that you would have to say to your people? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as we go through and we are reminded of Matthew chapter 24, I want you to uh, remember the purpose for which Matthew sits down to write. Matthew has an intention in mind when he sits down to pin his biography of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Remember what we said that it was. We said that the purpose of Matthew's gospel is to show to a particularly Jewish audience that Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee is the Jewish Messiah and their predicted coming king, the king that was predicted according to the Jewish scriptures. And now, brothers and sisters, let us go back and look more deeply at these uh, words that we have just read together. Do you remember what happened in the first three verses of Matthew chapter 24? There, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and then his disciples respond by questioning him. Wait, what's going to happen? Lord, when is this going to happen? And we said some things and we extracted some things as we looked at those first three verses. And brothers and sisters, we, we had to preface our, even our looking at and learning about Matthew chapter 24. Because it is an extremely controversial passage of scripture. It is a passage in scripture with which many faithful followers of Jesus have been faithfully studying this passage along with the rest of scriptures and those faithful individuals have come to different conclusions about what Jesus intended to communicate through his words here. And so it's controversial. It's not as clear as we would all hope and like for it to be. It's not those things. And so what we did as a preface to even studying it is we talked about something very important. We talked about preserving the unity of the body, though we have different understandings of certain things. And we talked about the concept of primary and secondary issues. And we, we boiled that down to this, brothers and sisters, that there is the acceptance or the rejection of certain beliefs that will cause a person to be saved or not saved. And those are things that we need to hold firm. Those are things that we all must agree on. But outside of those primary issues, there is a plethora, there are copious amounts of different beliefs and understandings and even practices that all fall under the banner and all under the umbrella of Christianity of which we, we can say it's okay to disagree. And we said this concerning the topic of eschatology itself. It said that our, our approach to the study of eschatology, end times, last things, we said that we should do that with humility and we should do that seeking to preserve the unity of the body of Christ. Seeking to preserve the, the fellowship and the, the peace and the unity that we have here. So here's what that looks like. We're not going to go around telling other brothers and sisters who have a different understanding of eschatology that they're wrong or that they're stupid because they don't agree with you and they don't understand things the way that you do, right? This is not one of those issues where we must take a stand in order to see someone as a faithful follower of Christ. Eschatology is not an area that needs to divide us, brothers and sisters, even though it is an important area of the scriptures. We said this, here is what unifies us, Union Chapel by, uh, Union Chapel by the Sea. These are the tenets concerning eschatology that we all must agree on that Jesus is coming back he's coming back he will physically part the skies and return in the same way that he left and that when Jesus physically returns he's not coming back as an eight pound six ounce humble little baby Jesus he is coming back as a messianic warrior he is coming back as a conquering king he is coming back to right all wrong he is coming back with a sword in his mouth he is coming back with a rod of iron and a scepter and ruling with a crown of many diadems on his head he is coming mounted on a noble steed and he will come to exact justice on the earth for all those who have lived in defiance and delusioned as if they have no maker 
Jesus will come again. He will come in judgment. And we also must accept what the scriptures say. That for us, there is an eternal, everlasting afterlife. And that will be different depending on what you do with Jesus Christ. If you have bowed your knee to him and his lordship now in your life before death, then for you, heaven awaits. The new heavens and the new earth is yours. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And if you have not, and all those who have lived, every soul that has ever existed, that God has brought into being, that has defied their creator, and has not bowed to Jesus, whom God has anointed and appointed ruler of the earth. If you have not, and those who have not, they will experience the just consequences of their life of defiance in a place called hell eternal everlasting conscious torment separated from god who is the source of all joy and all pleasure this is what we must agree on because these are the things that the bible is clear about and so as we approach this text and we said that it was controversial brothers and sisters remember that this passage is called called the olivet discourse jesus is teaching from this mountainside to his disciples he's declaring things he's asserting things to them and we said that there are four major ways that this passage is interpreted Right, And we oversimplified them to give us a concise understanding of them. We said either Jesus, what he's talking about is all going to happen at some far time in the future that for us still has not yet happened, or that it is all now, meaning within the lifetime of his disciples, that everything that Jesus says here will take place. Right, And then we have some more complex views, which is all now and all later. And that's the view that we chose, right? And then there's the view some now and some later, which is a view that we did not take. So we chose to take the all now and the all later view and to interpret Jesus' words through that. That when Jesus speaks, it's actually a double reference. That what he's saying, these things will take place during the lifetime of his disciples, and it will take place in the future again at some point in some way those things will be fleshed out. And so, brothers and sisters, we began to, to talk about those things, and we left those first three verse, v- verses taking note of this as we were being urged to preserve the unity of the body. Brothers and sisters, you might want to take note of this again. Remember that we said this. Whenever we create unnecessary divisions between ourselves and others in order to gain a sense of worth, importance, or belonging, we are in those moments failing to believe the gospel. When we create unnecessary divisions and, and we, we place people in certain categories that make them either inferior or superior to other people, when we do that, that natural human tendency to do that, when we do that, we are doing, and doing that motivated by a desire to give ourselves some sort of worth, some sort of value, or some sort of belonging to a particular subculture or a, a category of people, even within Christendom. When we do that, we do that by those things, motivated by those things, we are failing to believe the gospel, which says all people are important which says that all people have value, that all people have belonging. We all belong to the group of people that are called image bearers of God. And as Christians, we belong to the family of God. And so there is no need for us to create categories and and divide people unnecessarily so as to feel better about ourselves. If you have to do that, you're failing to remember what God has spoken. For God so loved the world. Amen? So we asked these questions in light of those first three verses. We said, are you organizing your health, your time, your relationships, and your resources around the reality of Jesus' return? When you think about those areas of your life and you think about yourself as a steward, are you making decisions in those areas based on the reality that Jesus Christ will physically return to the earth, will judge the world and cause there to be a new heaven and a new earth? Are you making your decisions in light of those truths? You should. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
Is there anywhere in, in your life that you are creating unnecessary divisions by making secondary issues primary issues? Is there anywhere in your life where you do that? I was speaking to a young couple uh, just a couple of days ago who were struggling with whether or not they should leave their fellowship. And I was just giving them counsel, and I was telling them, at our fellowship, um, we don't, those things that you hold very important that you are struggling with, young man, I, I would tell you at our church, we put those in the category of secondary issues. So if you come to our church and you begin to assert those things as if they are uh, most important, then you're going to be deemed divisive. They might be your preference. They might be very important to you. They might be your convictions that you've come through from studying the scriptures and being led by the Holy Spirit. But they fit into a category of secondary importance here. And you have to, you have to live your life and live out your faith in community in such a way that it does not create division for the family of God. And so it's important for us that we do that. Are you preserving the unity by not making secondary issues primary issues? We moved on from the first three verses and we looked at verses 4 through 13. And what took place in those, pas in those passages, in, in those verses, was Jesus predicted the preliminary signs of his coming and of the end of the age. Jesus began to describe for his disciples the climate and the condition of the world being before he came. Now, these are not signs indicating that he's coming. These are things that he says will be common, will be typical, and give you no signal of his coming because they will be common throughout the world. What are those things? Those preliminary signs? Jesus talked about there being false messiahs. He talked about there being an increase of wars and speculations of wars. He talked about there being more global hostility, international war going on. He talked about natural disasters. He talked about the opposition, persecution, and martyrdom of Christians, that that would rise, that there would also be, in light of that, a great apostasy or falling away of those who call themselves Christians. But they, when things get hot and when things get hard, they bail. They came to Jesus for convenience. And when things became no longer convenient for them, they threw Jesus away like a rabbit's foot that didn't work. And he warned that there would come a time of great apostasy. He talked about the rise of false prophets and false teachers. And he talked about a time of great moral decline. Now, Jesus could have been talking about his disciples, right? In his, the lifetime of his disciples. But I don't know about you, but brothers and sisters, I see the words of Jesus and what he said is talking about our day and age right here and right now. And if you open up your eyes and you compare it to the scriptures, you will see the same thing. None of those descriptors are positive things, right? And if you dwell on them too much, it can, it can raise up fear in you. But we said as we looked at those verses that our fear of the future is canceled out by Jesus' command to not be afraid. And our fear of the future and our fear of the things that Jesus says will happen, they are canceled out, listen, by the reality of the sovereignty of God. That God has a leash on Satan. And Satan cannot harm one hair on your head without first asking your father for permission. And you can trust that if, if evil comes to you, if hardship comes to you, that God has given his stamp of approval, that it will work out for your greatest good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Take comfort in that and do not be gripped and paralyzed by fear, brothers and sisters. We said that the Christian life is a call. Listen, the Christian life is a call to come and suffer for a little while and then to come and to drink from the fount of pleasure forever afterwards. To suffer for a little while than to rule and to reign and experience the joy of the Garden of Eden restored with Christ forever. This is the Christian life. This is what the gospel calls us to. We also said this, that the message of the gospel, which calls us to come and suffer for a little while, that the message of the gospel contradicts the prosperity ploys and the emotion-driven motivational speeches that we find occupying many platforms that claim to be representing Jesus and the word of God. 
Make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters. When you become a Christian and you seek to live out your convictions, every person who desires to live a godly life in this age will be persecuted. The question that you have to ask is, do you see the beauty of this cross? And do you see the beauty of the promises that God has for all those who have faithfully endured to the end? The cry is this, it will be worth it to endure. Continue to endure. You have chosen rightly. You have chosen the good thing. You have chosen the truth. Stay faithful. Stay on the narrow path. It will be worth it for you. And so we also said this because Jesus talked about a climate of, of constant deception. We said this, brothers and sisters, that deception will mark the time preceding the Lord's coming. People are out to deceive you. Why? Because Satan is alive and well, and he's like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he may devour. And he plays on the selfish nature, the sinful natures of individuals who have an agenda that is not the same agenda as God's agenda. So Satan working in collaboration with people who are seeking selfish and sordid gain will deceive you. They will tell you and assert things to be true that are not true, that are inconsistent with your faith. And listen, it will lead many astray. It will lead many away from the truth of Christianity. And listen to what we said. Deception feeds on ignorance. Deception feeds on ignorance. That's why I don't apologize for holding you here. And I hope I'm not really holding you here. But for having you here and teaching you intently, intensely for 50 minutes or more. Because you need to be educated so that you can be discerning, so that you can test every spirit by the spirit, so that you can rightly handle the word of God and you can discern whether or not someone who is speaking to you is speaking something that Jesus would say or something that Jesus would call a lie. That is important. And we don't want you to be ignorant. People who would want to lead you in a manner and keep you under their thumb and use you. Those individuals want you to stay ignorant. We want you to be ethical. We want you to be educated. We want you to be built up. We want to empower you to live lives that are full of knowledge, full of truth, and full of the Spirit. So we ask these questions in light of that description of Jesus uh, about the climate of the culture. Brothers and sisters, are you prepared to endure the preliminary signs that will plague the world before the Lord comes? Are you prepared? Are you ready for that? And we also ask this question, are you ruled by fear of the future? Or are you ruled by the confidence of the sovereignty of our God? I beg you and I encourage you to look to the sovereignty of God, the one who has a leash on Satan. We moved on from there and we looked at verses 14 through 28 and there Jesus gave us a description, listen, of a time of great tribulation where the, the burners and the, the furnace would be, would be warmed up even more, where there would be a time of great testing, of great challenge, of great uh, in, intense trials and tribulations. And during that time, brothers and sisters, we said this, as we looked at verse 14 and Jesus said that the, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole world. And then the end will come. We said this, that evangelism is integral, integral in Jesus' second coming and the ushering in of the eternal kingdom of heaven. So brothers and sisters, while we sit and we wait and we say, I've seen it all, this world just won't do for me. Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come. We're ready for the next world, Lord. I've had enough of this old fallen world. The, the, these old bones are decaying, though the outer man decay. Lord, I'm ready to see you. Well, if you want him to come, be telling people about them. You want to usher them in? Make sure everybody on your block knows about Jesus, whether they want to or not. You want Jesus to come? You want him to come, come Lord, quickly come? You want him to? Then be busy while you wait. Busy telling others that the Lord is on his way. We talked about this. We talked about the veracity of Jesus' words, the, the truthfulness, the reliableness, the accuracy of Jesus' words and the words of Scripture. 
We see that Jesus was truly a prophet. And we see that the Bible is truly the word of God because it has been evidenced in the fulfillment of Jesus' prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Jesus made a prediction and it came true in the life of his disciples. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. The temple was destroyed by the Romans not long after Jesus' ascension. Jesus predicted that. And a prophet is found true when what he said beforehand comes true. And Jesus did that. And what that should do for us is reaffirm the truthfulness that the Bible is trustworthy and that the words of our Lord Jesus are trustworthy and true. We also said this because of our all now and all later view. How can Jesus be specifically predicting the destruction both of Jerusalem and the temple, how can that apply both in the lifetime of his disciples and at a time in the future? And so we talked about that and we speculated that and we said these things. First off, we said the cyclical nature of history. The Jewish people are the most persecuted people group in history. In the history of humanity, they are. Because Satan knows that it is through the Jewish people that his death and his defeat will come. And so he has worked throughout human history to seek to annihilate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. And we also saw throughout history how the Jews have been going through tr great times of tribulation time and time again. And actually when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, it wasn't the first time that their, their order of worship has been cut off. Just read the Old Testament and you see the same thing happening before. And then we see it happening during the days of Jesus and his disciples and his apostles. And we also see one very interesting thing since then, brothers and sisters. We've seen that the nation of Israel has reemerged as, na as a nation, a sovereign, independent nation over time. That is from the hand of God. That this people group that were spread abroad in 1948 became a nation again. And who is to say that God will not, if he so chooses, allow their order of worship to be reconvened again, to commence once again, allowing for everything that happened during the days of Jesus' disciples to actually occur again as judgment on his people. Again. Here. And we ask these questions in light of that text, or that great description of, of great intense tribulation, brothers and sisters. We ask this, if that's true, if Jesus predicted those things and they came to pass in human history, and we are now benefactors witnessing both the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy, how then should we live? If what Jesus said about the past is true, then we should pay attention to what Jesus says about the future because that too is true and it has an impact and a bearing on our lives we should live lives that are faithful to Christ and we should live lives that are intentional to share the truth of Christianity with others we asked this question in light of our study of that passage we said does the veracity and the accuracy of biblical prophecy move you towards sober-minded obedience to Christ Brothers and sisters, here's what I'm saying. If you know that everything that Jesus said is going to happen is going to happen, does that impact how you live right here and right now? Does it? Does it have any effect on you? It should. Because you can take to the bank that what Jesus says about the future and his second coming, that it will happen. And you should be found right by him when he comes. We looked at verses 29 through 31, and there Jesus describes his second coming in judgment. And there, brothers and sisters, we came into another dilemma as we looked at this passage and have been interpreting this whole chapter through the all now and all later lens. That looked like those verses sound specifically like Jesus' second coming that will happen in the future that is yet to take place. Then how could it also be true of the all now 
view taking place in the lifetime of his disciples. And it was there that we talked about the concept of, listen, cosmic destruction language. And we said that that language that was used by Jesus is the same language that was used by the Old Testament prophets. And it talked, the language was hyperbolic, meaning its scope was a lot broader than it actually was in reality. So it talked about the destruction of the whole universe, but really it was a judgment on a particular group of people that God had decided it was time for their judgment. And Jesus does the same thing, and we can understand his words to also be true. Though it sounds like cosmic destructive language, it could be the way that Jesus is emphatically describing the judgment that he's bringing on Israel for rejecting the Messiah. And that's what we came away with, and we asked these questions in light of those three verses there. Are you ready for Christ's return? Those words there, verse 29, 30, and 31, are a description that should sober us all up, referring to the Lord's return, whether it be his return in judgment symbolically or his literal physical return in reality. Are you ready for it? What will you be found doing when the Lord comes again? What will you be found doing? Will you be in your rebellious phase? Or will you be in that time when you are serving the Lord faithfully and you can look to the the sky when he comes and say, I told you, I told you, he's coming. What will you be found doing? And does knowing the outcome of the future have any impact on your decision making in the present? Does it have any effect on you? If it doesn't, you should question whether or not you're really a Christian. Because to know what Jesus has said should impact and dictate how we live our lives. We looked at verses uh, 32 through 41, and there Jesus tells a parable of a fig tree, and he emphasizes the certainty of his prophecy. Listen, Jesus doubles down on his prophecy. Yeah, I said it. I said it, and I meant it. And you can take it to the bank, because that's really what's going to happen. And he gave a parable of the the fig tree in order to say, hey, guys, look, you can tell the season by looking at the behavior of this little tree. When it starts to have leaves, when things start to blossom, summer's coming, right? There are indicators that that time that you're looking for in the future is coming. And he says, pay attention to the indicators and let that persuade you that what he said is certain to come about in time. So that parable declares the eminence that Jesus could come at any moment, that he could come at any moment, that his return could be now, and that it is always for us. It is near. We also said, according to that, Jesus described the nature of his coming, and he said that it would be unknown, unexpected, and sudden. Brothers and sisters, how does that work when people try to put dates on Jesus' return? It doesn't fit into any of those categories. Unknown, unexpected, or, uh, or sudden. No. No, you can't put a date on it, and that's how he intended it. We also spent some time talking about some heavy doctrine, some heavy teachings of the Scriptures. We talked about the doctrine of the Trinity, that one God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We talked about the deity of Jesus, that Jesus is God. And we talked about the humanity of Jesus, that Jesus is also a human being in every sense of humanity. Jesus is that. So we talked about the deity and the humanity of Jesus, and we also talked about this thing, ready? It's called Trinitarian redemption. That that which brings about our salvation could only be accomplished by a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father has sent the Son. The Son pays for our sins, and the Spirit awakens us to believe it. That is a Trinitarian redemption, and our God is beautiful, and so is our salvation. Can I get an amen on that? Anybody so? Thank you. All right. I thought that was beautiful. (laughs) We also talked about the concept of separation, brothers and sisters, because Jesus does. He says one will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Well, that's not nice. Jesus, there's a disparity there. Jesus, you're not treating everybody equally. Uh, Yep, you get it. You got it. That's right. He's not. Because 
truth by nature is exclusive. Truth by nature is exclusive. And we said this, the only demographics that will matter on that great day of judgment is Christian and non-Christian. Did you hear that? I don't care what you identify yourself as or what you identify yourself with. The only thing that will matter to you on the day that God, your creator, calls you into account is whether or not you bowed your knee to his son and your king, Jesus. That's it. That's it. We ask these questions in light of that, um, that passage there. Are you going to leave the truth of Christianity behind in order to be socially accepted? Because what I just said to you about people going to heaven and hell, that's not socially acceptable. When I, when I was on my interfaith panel, the lady said, wait, what are happening to people who aren't Christians? They're going to hell. Oh, this guy. This guy, is he's not very nice. Telling people the truth isn't nice? Or do you not like the truth? What do you expect me to do? I'm here to represent what the Bible says. It says it everywhere. That there are consequences for what we believe and how we live our lives because we were put here by an eternal creator. It's not my job to like or not like the consequences. I didn't even choose to be here. I have to accept reality. I was placed here by someone other than myself and I belong to him. Amen? Amen. So are you going to seek popularity and acceptance from the culture? And brothers and sisters, we ask this question. Are you personally heeding Jesus' commands for Christians to live lives of vigilance? Brothers and sisters, can I tell you something? I don't know everything. And I hope you don't think that I think I know everything, because I don't. But I can tell you this much. Nothing delights me more as a pastor than for people to be wrestling in their thinking to be wrestling to make a decision hon is it really worth it to invest that much money here when we could be investing this here hon should we, should we send our kids to public school or private school or should we just keep them at home wrestling I'm not telling you to answer those questions but God wants us to be wrestling with those things we need to be wrestling with those things. Do I keep those friends or do I just distance myself from those people? Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me. My heart is for you, God. Whatever you say, I will do. But God, I'm going to be honest, I don't know what to do. I'm seeking what your scripture says. I'm seeking wise counsel from those who are older and wiser. But I'm, I'm wrestling. I just, I don't know the answer, God, but I'm wrestling. And that's where he wants you to be. Wrestling. Some things are clear, and some things he wants to take you deeper, deeper into prayer and intimacy with his spirit that he might be able to teach you about himself. But we should be wrestling, brothers and sisters. We should be wrestling, and we should be vigilant in all of our decision-making. In that last passage there, verses 42 to uh, 51, there Jesus tells a parable of a faithful slave and of an evil slave. In that passage, Jesus explained what it looks like for Christians to be vigilant and to be found faithful by God's standards upon his return. Listen, you can think all day, you know, I do a pretty good job. <laughs> that doesn't matter. What matters is whether God thinks you did a good job. You can say, oh, well, you know, I, I go to church on Christmas and Easter. You know what I mean? I'm doing pretty good. I'm faithful, you know? I get to keep the name Christian, right? Because that's where my parents go all the time, and I show up on the holidays. You know, that's... I'm faithful, man. And Jesus will look at them on that day and say, Who are you? I never knew you. My kingdom is not for you. It is for those who have longed for my coming and who have spent their entire lives seeking to draw all men to me. Will you be found faithful by him? 
we talked about the, the relationship and the responsibility of individuals and the local church in light of Jesus' parable here. Brothers and sisters, we said that the responsibility of church leaders is to influence believers, listen, to stay on the narrow path and to help them to remain vigilant. Did you hear that? Our job is to help you stay on the narrow path, right? So think about a shepherd and sheep, right? Right? What happens when a sheep starts wandering away from the herd? The shepherd has to go with the rod and bring them back. Right? Right? Sometimes you get tapped by the staff. Right? Well, oh, that hurt. Are you being mean to me? Are you judging me? Are you being legalistic? No. No, fool. I'm trying to keep you in line with the rest of the herd so that you don't go walking off a cliff somewhere. Well, who are you to judge? I'm your shepherd. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> the road's right there. The rest of the group's right there. You're over here about to walk off a cliff. Who's crazy here, me or you? Am I really a bad guy? Am I really being mean? Or are you really in danger of losing your life? You guys understand that? I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here to make you laugh. I'm here to make sure that that narrow path that leads to life, that all of you are on it when you die. And sometimes that means that some very sober words need to be spoken in our lives to keep us sober, right? How does a shepherd do that? How does a church leader do that? By cultivating a life of prayer. And I don't know if you guys picked up on it or not, but Pastor Tim's very, very excited about Wednesday nights and how people come out and they're spending 25 and 30 minutes in prayer. And like most people are like, I don't spend that much time concentrating on anything. Right, because it's a fight and it's a struggle. It's a discipline of the mind. It's an aligning of the heart and of the soul. That's what it is. And for some people, it's awkward. How much longer before he wraps this thing up? I'm not talking about other people. Sometimes I feel like that, you know? I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do the next thing, you know? But it's a fight. Watch and, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. Amen? cultivating a life of prayer that's how your leaders ought to lead you bible literacy which means they're not their goal their agenda as a church leader is not to entertain you but to educate you you guys being entertained or educated hopefully you're being educated in a way that's not ways too intense that we could never laugh but hopefully the goal is that you're being educated and cultivating obedience a life of prayer a life of biblical literacy and a life of obedience to our god that's a church leader's responsibility. And Jesus places as a primary priority of church leaders the task of faithfully teaching God's word. And that should be the deal breaker. That should be the non-negotiable. That should be what you use to bring your family into a local church calling itself followers of Jesus. The responsibility of every believer is to commit yourself to a local gathering, to submit yourself to a community that is actually accomplishing that, keeping you on the narrow narrow path, keeping your family on the narrow path, going against the, chi, the, the, the tide of the culture, going against the current, going against the mainstream, and that is saying the only thing that will matter when you stand before God is what you did with Jesus. That's what you should be looking for. And we ask these questions in light of that. Do you see the gospel as simply something great that God has done for us in the past, or are you looking forward to the fulfillment of of all that Jesus has accomplished. You know that? Like Jesus paid it all, but we're still downloading the residuals of that. We haven't even seen the full effect of what Jesus has accomplished. And I'm longing for that, and I hope that you are too. Because in the end, though we are smaller than the majority, we are the winners. We are the winners. Because God has secured our soul's salvation. Let me ask you this question. What do you value more, brothers and sisters? Securing your personal, present comforts in this short life. Or securing the future eternal rewards of those who serve Jesus wholeheartedly in this short life. What matters more to you? Your creature comforts or the glory of God and the salvation of souls. I'm not asking you to answer that intellectually. I'm not even asking you to tell me what the Bible says the right answer to that is. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Be honest with yourself. 
see what you're doing with your time, see what you're doing with your health, see what you're doing with your relationships, see what you're doing with your resources, and then tell me what they indicate, where your values are, what means the most to you. Because what you say won't add up to everything that you actually do when you make your decisions in your personal life. That's what matters. That's what's telling the truth about what you believe and what matters the most to you. Brothers and sisters, as we close, I want to remind you of something. We have studied Matthew chapter 24, and to be completely honest with you, I'm a little relieved because it was the hardest passage of Scripture I've ever studied and had to teach someone else. And it was really a work of the Spirit if any good came from that passage. And I will continue to wrestle with it as many faithful men and women have over time and still have come to different conclusions. But we know this for certain. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. You can bet your bottom dollar that Jesus is coming. And I want to leave you with this thought. No teaching has happened where no learning has happened. And no learning has happened where no application is happening. You can come here and you can say, yeah, you know, we, we walk through verse by verse through Matthew chapter 24. You know, it was very interesting. There were certain points and I can articulate to you the four different views that Christians hold. Yeah, I can do that. And what happened when you walked out of here? What happened? Did you speak to one person? about the reality of their soul being in jeopardy? Did you even consider that coworker, that loud mouth, cussing like a sailor, obnoxious person that just rubs you like sandpaper? Did you contemplate that that's a soul? That's a soul that is blind and desperately in need of the same thing that God has graciously given to you? We have read of Jesus coming. Has it, has it changed you at all? Has it even caused you to just be honest and say, God, my priorities are not right? And I, to be honest, it's hard, Lord, because I'm seeking security. I'm seeking, I'm seeking comfort. I'm, I'm seeking to keep my place. It's hard, and I know i got to change, but, Lord, I'm just confessing today that it's hard, and I know that I need to change. Has anything happened? Is anything going on? I certainly hope so. Last night, I left my friend's house at 4 o'clock in the morning. My friend, who I have seen two times in the last decade, in the last 10 years, that I went to high school with. This guy who went to summer camp with me, Christian summer camp. I invited him to summer camp. And as I sat with him and his wife and his two beautiful children in their dining room, just sharing life with them, I found out that he's a confessing atheist and that she is just spiritual. Just spiritual. Accepting anything and everything from everybody. And I sat there and I talked to them for as long as they would let me. You know why? Because of Matthew chapter 24. Because Jesus will come and he will judge my friend whom I love. And he will judge his wife and what they teach to their children. He will judge their souls. And it was worth it. Every minute of every painstaking hour was worth it. And that was because we have studied and I was more sober about the reality that Jesus is coming. I don't say that as a notch on my belt or to brag to you. I say that because of what Paul said. Follow me as I follow Christ. My goal was not to get him to come to Union Chapel by the sea. My goal was to get him into the everlasting kingdom of God. And it didn't happen last night. So you pray for him and his wife. And I'm going to go back if he lets me. And I'm going to invite him into my house. And we're going to sit and we're going to talk. And we're going to talk about things that don't matter. Only to get to things that will matter for all eternity. I invite you to be doing the same thing. Because that's what we should be doing as Christians. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. And I just pray what Jesus prayed. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.